So hi everyone, we are here today with uh, Duke Bignoli, uh, who is an American bodybuilder. And uh, today we are going to tackle a very interesting topic, which is the one of uh, training smarter in order to be able to train your whole life, keep the muscular development you want without sacrificing the integrity of your body, injuries and stuff like that. And of course to do that, something which is very uh, smart to do would be to turn towards uh, smart and experienced bodybuilder who still train over 50 years old, who are, who are still in great shape. And this is the case of Du. So hi Du, welcome. Hello Paul, how are you? I'm very fine, thank you. Uh, can you introduce yourself uh, to, to the people, you know, um, who are you, what do you do, what have you done in the fitness industry yes, before? Yes, okay, wonderful, thank like you. Um, my name is, uh, in the French pronunciation, it would be Brignol. Exactly. Douglas Brignol. Uh, and, um, I was born here in California. Uh, my parents were Chilean. My father was of French origin. And uh, I started working out at about 14 years old uh, at home with just the basic yeah. exercises, the basic barbell. Uh, but early on, I, and I was figuring things out. And, you know, some things felt right, some things didn't feel right. And I was always asking the questions that would later end up being very, very important. Um, I started working out with Bill Pearl at the age of 15. I made an agreement with him where I could not afford membership, and I, he allowed me to scrub the showers in exchange for membership. Uh, he's a very important figure in my life. You know, he was, I guess you could say he was my mentor, but I was always a very stubborn kid. Okay. So I would never always take advice from someone, even a four-time Mr. Universe winner. <laughs> um, and I adore the man. I'm going to be doing an exhibition for him uh, this coming October. Um, he's about 80-something years old now. But um, I started competing by the time I was 16. Okay. One year after starting there at Bill Pearl's gym, I competed in a local contest, teenage division, took second place. By the time I was 19, I had won Teenage Mr. America and Teenage Mr. Universe. Excuse me, Teenage California, Teenage Mr. America. And then I competed for Mr. California at the age of 22. Then um, I won my division in Mr. America at 26 and also my division of Mr. Universe at 26 and I had a lot of time in between contests. Sometimes I'd wait five years, sometimes 10 years, sometimes 11 years um, and I'm competing again this coming uh, October and November. So this is my 40th year since first starting to compete at the age of 16. I'm 56 years old now. Okay, impressive. It's very impressive. Uh, just a, qu a quick question. Why do you take usually uh, so long between two competitions? Well, you know, most of the time it wasn't planned. Okay. <laughs> In other words, most of the time when I stopped competing, I thought I was done competing. Yeah. I thought I wasn't going to do it anymore. And then five years later, I decide that I want to do it again. Yeah. Um, like, for example, when I won Mr. America, Mr. Universe Division at the age of 26, I thought, well, what's the point of competing again? I've won everything. I've won, well, I've won international. Yeah. Um, but then at 31, you start thinking, you know, I'm still young at 31. Yeah. And I kind of want to do this again before I regret that I didn't do it again. Mm -hmm. So then I went back and I won Northwestern America. And that same year, by the way, I went to the Nava Universe for the first time in London. Um, but that was my third contest that year, and it was just dieting for too long, so I didn't do very well. Um, but still, it was an honor to be in the Nava Universe that first time. And then that was, uh, let's see, that was, uh, uh, I was at the age of 31 then. I didn't compete again for nine years. At the age of 40, I competed again in just a local Los Angeles championship because I missed it. Then I thought I was done. And then I didn't compete again until I was 50, 10 more years. <laughs> and then, um, and so, but the truth is, if I, if I had done it differently, I probably would have done it the same way. In other words, I, I, I think it's good to not be seen too frequently. Yeah. I think the audiences get tired of seeing a guy over and over and over again, and a body doesn't change much in one year. Um, and also, you know, when, let's say I compete at the age of 50, 
people know they haven't seen me on stage for, for 10 years. So it's more interesting yeah. to see the guy that you haven't seen. You know, so what have you been doing? Well, look at this. <laughs> yeah, so you it really, from a marketing standpoint, mm -hmm. it, it's ended up being better that I didn't compete so many times. Yeah, okay. I, I, ten, I tend to agree with that. And also because it gives you more time to let your body cope with uh, the difficulty you, you make him go through through dieting and competing. Right, it's abusive on the body to diet yeah. that hard. Also, you know, I think it's important for people to experiment with different training methods. Yeah. And when you're always feeling the pressure that you cannot afford to experiment, you end up doing the things you've been doing, even though they're wrong, because you're afraid to try something new and different. Okay. There have been times when I've tried something drastic, like for example, I competed in 2012, having done nothing but incline exercises for the pectoral muscle. Because I wanted to see what it would do. Yeah. The answer, of course, is terrible. <laughs> it is the worst thing in the world. The incline exercises are terrible for the chest. But that's proof, is that you, if you're willing to do an experiment for a solid year, what would happen if I did this? Then you can really understand your body better than you would otherwise. Yeah. So you, you try to only do incline presses to develop your upper chest, I guess, because you wanted to have well, those you know, obviously we, we Yes, we've all been told that inclines yeah. is the exercise for the upper pec. Exactly. So if that's true, and you did nothing but incline exercise, you should have a fantastic upper chest. The truth is I had no upper chest and no lower chest. Okay. And the reason for that is because one of the things we'll talk about is that there are no pectoral fibers above the arm line. So when you're moving in that direction, unless you have pectoral fibers on your chin or on your nose, you're not moving toward your pectorals. The highest pectoral muscle on the sternum is already moved toward when you're doing a flat press. Because the movement has to be parallel to the fibers you point to. Yes, okay. parallel to the fibers and also, you know, it's a simple rule, muscles always pull toward their origin. They cannot pull in any other direction, yeah. right? So, also from an evolutionary standpoint, you know, we used to be on all four legs, quadruped, yeah. you know, and as we became more evolved and we stood more upright, we were pushing progressively more downward but where in nature would we have ever had to push in an upward angle? I mean, there were no incline benches in the, in, in the jungles. <laughs> yeah. So, but the other thing, too, is that, you know, if I always tell people, we have to know the anatomy a little bit, but I always tell people, if you want to know what muscle is working, all you have to do is say, toward which muscle origin is your operator, operating lever moving? So when you look at something like that, you go, well, so when, you, when I do parallel bar dips, I'm actually doing a little bit of clavicular pec, right? Because that's the path, yeah. right? Front deltoid and clavicular pec pull parallel to the body. So if you're doing this, it's not a very good one because it would be better to come up a little bit higher, yeah. right? But at least you're on the same path yeah. as the clav clavicular pec. So some people get, you know, I thought it was lower pec. Well, it's actually, if anything, it's more clavicular pec, but it's neither one of them very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, people tend to be afraid uh, to, to lose an exercise they've been told has been great and has kind of worked for them, even though another yeah. exercise would have been better. So they are afraid of losing this, of you know, throwing away this exercise that have been kind of working for them because they are afraid of losing all the muscle development. Right. But if they do something else, they will you know, go further back. Right. And so I know I've been there too. Mm -hmm. um, All of us. Yeah, but we'll, we'll talk about that later, you know, yeah. that exercise we should avoid. So can you just tell us a bit more about when you were young? So at the very beginning, of course, uh, at around 14 and 50 years old, 15 years old, and also when you were more in your 20s and how you enjoyed training when you were preparing the Mr. Universe. Right, well, when I started, I started, as, as everyone starts, with a clean slate, no knowledge. Yeah. Right. And the only knowledge we're exposed to is the magazines and the guys in the gym that do this and this and this, and they're big. Yeah. And so they're persuasive. You believe they know what they're doing because they're big. But I always tell people, you know, if a, if a big guy does 10 things, it's impossible that all 10 of those things contributed equally to that, to that body. Some contributed less some contributed more, maybe some contributed nothing, but we don't know this yet. So in the beginning I did, I did everything. I did too much, too many sets, sometimes 40 sets of body part. 
because, you know, we're ambitious, we're yeah. eager, we're enthusiastic. And then, but I was always very analytical. So little by little, I, I would start coming to certain conclusions about, well, we all do, which ones we like more, which ones we like less, you know? Like, I've never liked Upright Rose. I've always thought this is such a weird feeling on the wrists. Where's the lockout? Where's the contraction? I, it was a vague, ambiguous exercise. I never liked that, so I didn't do much of that. So, oh, And I've always had the good fortune of being very connected to what I'm feeling. So if I didn't feel it where I was supposed to feel it, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't just keep doing it because I'm supposed to do it. I, if I didn't like it, I didn't feel it, I wouldn't do it. Which is a key point. But, but along the way, I would always, you know, um, in fact, still to this day, I mean, my thought evolution has been going on consistently for 42 years. I mean, there are things that I believe today that I didn't believe two years ago. So there are conclusions that I've been arriving at, but um, it's a, it, and so I, I can't really say that there was ever a moment when I figured it all out. But I will say that I'm more uh, certain today about how the body works and why the body works this particular way than ever before, which is why I'm writing this book that I told you about. But um, I suppose what I would say is that when I was competing for Mr. America and Mr. Universe, um, and this is true for everybody who's in their 20s, by the way, you can abuse your body pretty well and you'll still make good progress. Yeah. <laughs> when you get older, that's not true. When you get older, you, if you do an exercise that isn't truly efficient, it's not going to give you the results it used to give you when you were 20-something. Yeah. And it's going to be more damaging to your body. So in, in a way, it is good to grow older because that allows you to test things in a, in a more pure way. Yeah. If I could do it over again, I would do back then exactly what I'm doing right now. I feel that what I'm doing right now is the perfect routine, finally, uh, which is why I'm competing because I want to show on that stage this is the result you can get from this precise workout. Okay, so the way you were training uh, before, you would consider it like a heavy, explosive type of training, split routines, full body routines? No, I never liked power moves. I never liked deadlifts. I never liked power cleans. I never liked super heavy bench presses. I didn't like bench presses. I like dumbbell work. I like being able to feel the muscle contract in the center, just being out here. You know, I've always thought that's why would I be okay not finishing that range of motion on chest? But then having to finish it everywhere else. It's like it's either always good or it's always bad. It can't be okay here, but not okay here. Yeah. So um, I was never very big on heavy, heavy, heavy. Uh, the heaviest I've gone in terms of reps is, you know, eight reps, six rep sets, and that's, that's good. But I've discovered over the years that um, the heavier reps, eight reps, six reps, um, are more productive, more effective, if you started with the higher reps first, which is what I do now, I start with 50 reps, 40 reps, 30 reps, 20 reps, and then I finally get heavier and heavier and heavier until I'm doing, but I get a much better result doing that than if I would have just started with 10, 10, 10, 10, 8, 6, 4. Okay. So then you, you can't do uh, three or four exercises different for body parts. You have to select and pick one, maybe two maximum exercise for your body part, I guess, if you have to go from 50 to 6, 8 reps? Well, yes. I mean, the truth is that, you, that most body parts only need one exercise. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is completely against conventional wisdom. You know, conventional wisdom is this ridiculous thought that muscles have multiple angles, that this works the upper bicep, this works the lower bicep, this works the yeah. inner bicep, this works the... That is complete nonsense. Yeah. I mean... You know, in my book, I show the bicep tendon crosses the elbow in one place. Yeah. And no matter yeah. what you do, that joint is a hinge. That tendon does one thing. It's impossible. I even drew what might be considered the only possible way that you can work. I created a ball and hinge elbow. Yeah. Right? A ball and joint, like a, like a shoulder. Ball and joint elbow with two tendons, one for each of the bicep. This is the only way that you can work the outer head and the yeah, inner head. Exactly. You know, if you don't have that, if you have one tendon, which we all do, and we have a hinge joint, which we all do, then it's going to work all or nothing. So the only exception to that rule, really, uh, is the chest. 
the chip. Petrol. Because the petrol is more fans. And well, the trapezius too. The trapezius back. pulls up and it pulls back, right? And the pectoral muscle pulls sort of straight with a very slight downward angle and then very downward. And, and that's pretty much it. Everything else. Lats, perhaps. Delta. Lats, um, no. No, I mean, I do two exercises for my back. Yeah. One is a lat pull-in, right, which is coming from an angle. Yeah. And that pretty much hits all the loose lat fibers because the origin is on the spine. Yeah. And then I do a scapular retraction, pulling my shoulders back. Because, you know, when people do rowing exercises, thinking that they're working their trapezius, they're surprised to discover their trapezius don't even connect to the arms. Yeah. You're doing mostly arm pulling, and yet what you want to work is not even connected to the arms. It's the middle trapezius, right? So you're getting when you're doing a standard rowing exercise, you're getting mostly rear deltoid and teres major, right? I always tell people if you were a marionette, a marionette doll puppeteer, and you had a puppet in front of you, and you were going to pull on his arm, you wouldn't stand on the spine and pull that way. You would get behind him and pull this way. Yeah. That's the motion of a, of, of a rowing act, you know, yeah, yeah. it's straight back. So you, the, the resistance has to come from over there, 45 degrees and over there, 45 degrees. And it has to be about 80% of scapular yeah. and only a little bit of arm. And that little bit of arm might work the highest lat fibers. But for the most part, those high lat fibers are still working when you're doing your pull in. Okay. So... Today, the way you train, you say you would pick one exercise that would be the best exercise you can find to work uh, your muscle. So, mm -hmm. an exercise that would allow you know, to, to have the motion in a parallel way of your, your fibers and right. allow a very powerful contraction. So, to keep resistance in the contracted position. And you would just do this exercise for, you said, 50, 40, 30, 20. Uh, 12, 10, 8, something like that, so 8 to... Yeah, yeah, sometimes 6, sometimes 4, depending on, you know, how I feel that day and what muscle it is, yeah. Okay, so you, you go between 7 to 10, to 10 uh, sets until you feel yeah, you... Yeah, sometimes, you... sometimes 12, 14 sets. Okay. Same exercise. Yeah, until you felt that you, you've, you've succeeded in uh, stimulating growth, I guess. Yes, until I've reached the optimal weight and the lowest reps. How do you know that? How do you know you have the optimal weight and you worked enough to stimulate? Well, okay, for example, let's say I'm doing my tricep extensions, yeah. which I do on a decline bench with dumbbells, right? I start with 50, I go to 40, 30, 20. Um, there is a feeling that you cannot describe in any other way other than a feeling, right? It, it, it would be nice to have a formula. But the problem is everyone's at a different level. And the more advanced you are, the more you can tolerate and the more you need more volume you need so you have to use your instinct yeah. uh, you have to use your kinesthetic ability to sense when that muscle has had it right now you don't have to take it until it's completely shot but you do have to take it to a point where you feel it's it's exhausted enough so what I end up doing is I when I come through my tricep sets I usually end up by the time I get to my 10 rep sets I do two sets of 10, two sets of eight, two sets of six, two sets of four. Very slow, very deliberate, right? And that's it. And then I'm done. Um, and it's a feeling. That's interesting. And it has to do with the volume. It's something you cannot get with anything else other than volume of sets. So, yeah, you were saying it right now that very slow. So you perform your exercise very slow, especially, I guess, when you are in the lower reps range. Yes. Yes, so, but always deliberate. Yes, In other words, you don't yeah, want any yeah. swinging at all. No. no momentum at all. It has to be all the muscle doing the work. So do you prefer to do isolating exercise than compound exercise? So do you really try to target I, I one muscle in particular? I would, say, I would say generally, yes. I'd say the only compound exercise I actually do is, is cable squats. Yeah, cable squats. Everything else. Because see, here's the thing is, you know, this idea of compound exercise uh, is, is, is really not a good thing for bodybuilding. And I'll explain why. Um, weight training started off as a circus act. Yeah. Displays of strength, right? This is how it started. And, and strength 
was always something that was celebrated. There's in my book, I, I show a cover of a magazine, and at the bottom of the magazine says, weakness is a crime, do not be a criminal. Which of course implies ethics. Yeah. It's unethical to be weak. Well, what they're actually saying is it's, it's unethical to, to lift a weight that isn't a large weight. And if you do an isolated exercise, that isn't a large weight because it's only one muscle doing the lifting, yeah. right? So this is the mentality of what arrived us believing that compound was good, okay? But here's what I always say is people say a compound exercise is good because it works three muscles at one time. And I say, but do you really think that it works each of those three muscles as well as those muscles can be worked? If the answer is yes, great, right? How convenient. Yeah. But but most people would tell you, no, if I do parallel bar dips, I still have to do another tricep exercise and I still have to do another chest exercise. And I go, well, that's interesting because I only do one tricep exercise and one chest exercise and then I'm done. So you're the one who's doing more work, yeah. not me. So, you know, it would be foolish to believe that a compound exercise like parallel bar dips um, or let's say bent over barbell row. Bent over barbell row is an even better example because when you're doing a bent over barbell row, you are neither doing a correct lat movement nor are you doing a correct trapezius movement. And yet what is most loaded is your lower back. So when you're doing a compound movement, it's impossible to think that the muscle you want to prioritize is the one that's getting the most load yeah. and the muscle you least want to prioritize is getting the least load. It, it, these are these are exercises that are, are originally invented a hundred years ago. So, you know, it's much better to use an exercise like, let's say, these cables, scapular retraction, that gives you 100% what you want and maybe 60-70% forward pull, less of what you want on the lower back, more of what you want on the inner back. Then you can really target it. Okay, so of course, compound exercises would be good for someone who is trying to, you know, upgrade his fitness abilities uh, toward maybe helping performance in another sport, you know, learning his muscles to work together. When we, when we are talking about bodybuilding, isolation is king. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, there's no doubt that um, you could benefit more from compound movements if you are doing something similar to that movement on the football field or soccer field, if you're simulating the U.S., But it's not entirely correct to say that, that isolated exercises are dysfunctional. In other words, if you strengthen all these muscles separately, they will still know how to work together when the time is right. It's, it, that's a, a false assumption to think that if I work these muscles together, they'll work together better later. If I work them separately, they won't work well together later. Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> you know, muscles know what they're doing. If they're, set, if they're strengthened separately, When you're out there on the football field, they'll know how to work together. And so, if we talk again about you know the the, uh, the, the, the speed you use when you perform your exercise, uh, I, had, I have personally the feeling that, that going slower allows you to maybe uh, be more gentle on your whole organism, on your whole body, your articulations, your tendons, your muscle, first to warm them up. And as soon as they are warm and uh, soft, uh, it's, it's harder to kind of hurt them, I guess. And uh, by warming up your articulation, you're able also to block it further and, and, ha and have a, a stronger contraction of the muscle because you are able to block the articulation, which would not be possible if you would be, uh, I guess, uh, cold. So yeah, cold. Uh, you know, look, first, the first thing I'll say is that my experience has been um, over the years that I thought contracting the muscle, squeezing the muscle at the end of every repetition was critically important. And as it turns out, I think not so much now. I think the first two-thirds of, of the range of motion are the most important. That is where the muscle has the most strength capacity. That is where the, um, what are they, the filament fibers Know, are more stretched and so they have more recoilability as those fibers start overlapping they start losing strength um, and you know you would think that by contracting the muscle during the workout that your ability to contract the muscle 
on stage will be improved. But as it turns out, not so much, because I don't pretty much contract anything anymore. When I do my tricep exercises, I leave off that last 5-10% of the range of motion. And I can still flex my tricep when I get on stage. Okay. So I haven't lost anything from it. But I will say, in terms of the speed, that um, the, the whole point of exercise for bodybuilding is to, is to tax the muscle, to make the muscle work as hard as the muscle can work. So anything that causes that muscle to work harder, to feel more fatigue, is going to be better. And usually going faster minimizes that. Yeah. It, it is better to go slower. It is better to be deliberate. It is better to use no assistance from any other muscle, from, from momentum. Let the muscle do all the work. But then squeezing very, very hard your muscle against resistance will make it harder. Plus, you would, you would, would gain a few inches of range of motion. So you may recruit even more fibers, especially if you're going slower. And at the well, end, you're, you're, you're right in theory. You are correct in theory. And I've just discovered that, that it doesn't pan out in the real world. That that extra range of motion doesn't matter very much. That last 5 or 10% range of motion, even though it fatigues the muscle more, does not necessarily produce more growth. What can I say? I mean, I've tried it both ways. Yeah, and you you realize, you realize that if you just not contract, fully contract your muscle, you get a better workout, a better feeling, yeah. and you have the sensations that you, you've managed to trigger you know, growth, uh, stimulate your growth, even though you... And, and I also feel that, it, that, that the full lockout on most exercises kind of strains the joints. This is, by the way, a, a physiological fact with leg extensions. There is a, 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 what they call a, a screw home rotation yeah. of the femur and the tibia where the condyles have to fit in place. And, you know, that's, if you do that over and over again, there's going to be some wearing on that, those condyles. And for what? I can still contract my quadricep muscle just fine on the stage, even though I didn't do it in the workout. So, you know especially having done it now, as I said, 41, 42 years, we look for ways that um, allow us to prevent those sore joints. Yeah. And that I've just discovered that a full lockout, a full squeeze of the muscle has more cost than it does benefit. Okay. So it brings, it brings results, but uh, it's too expensive in terms of, I guess, uh, wearing the, the articulation. So it's right, the, and, and it brings, as you said, it brings benefit, but it doesn't bring as much benefit as the early part of the range of motion. Yeah. Okay. So it would be like uh, bench pressing, uh, heavy bench press. Okay, it will help uh, develop your chest, but you're going to hurt your shoulders a lot, where you would be, you would be able to develop as much and even perhaps better your, your pectoral muscles on a cable crossover, for instance, without using so much weight? Yes, well, the first thing I would say is, um, okay, we're, we're talking about two different directions of resistance. So, are you still there? Yeah. Okay, because I can't see you. Uh, the, the bench press or dumbbell press has a straight back direction of resistance. I call that free weight gravity direction of resistance. When you're using a cable crossover, the, the traditional kind that are, you know, 12 feet apart, yeah. you've got a very wide resistance, right? So now what typically happens is you change the resistance curve of the exercise. And any exercise that you do on a cable crossover is going to start off with much less resistance and end up with much more resistance. And that is the opposite of the typical strength curve of the muscle. We are stronger at the beginning and weaker at the end. So you're going to be getting an insufficient amount of resistance where you most need it and can most benefit from it. And then when you get to the center, you're going to be getting a little bit more resistance than you ideally would like to have. And so what you do is you, you, you adjust the weight so that you can bring them together, right? But then that way, that weight that you can bring together is too light back here. If you choose a weight that's challenging here, then you can't bring them together, right? Yeah. So... The problem is that, that without understanding the physiology of muscles, you know, the strength curve of muscles, 
and without understanding the importance of selecting the right direction of resistance and all these things, most of us typically just choose what we think feels good. And when you bring your hands together against resistance, you feel a contraction that you don't feel when you're doing the dumbbell presses. And we think that that indicates that we're getting better development and closer to the sternum development, which is, of course, impossible, right? Because muscle fibers contract all or nothing. So um, what I do is I, I use uh, the, the free motion cable machine because you can swing the arms in so they're not as wide as the standard, but they're narrower than, or they're narrower than the cables, but they're a little bit wider than the direction of resistance you'd get from free weight. So it's only slanting outward a tiny bit. That gives me a little bit more in the, in, at the end of the range of motion as, as compared to dumbbells, which gives you nothing at the end, right? When you're using dumbbells, you get nothing at the end. Yeah. Cables that are slanted out just a little bit give you something in the center, but not so much that it's prohibitive to, to finish the movement. <coughs> well, you can still squeeze the dumbbell <coughs> sorry, against each other and, and have yes. a, a, you know, a, voluntary, a voluntary contraction. Keep some tension. Yeah, and, and, and although there's, it's, not, it's not against resistance. It's just like isometric. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. And, and there's another issue too. It depends on the size of your dumbbells, but you know your shoulders are about like there, right? So if you bring them inside that line, then you you've got inside the apex, and they start to fall in, yeah. right? So I always bring it right to the apex because if you go to the other side of the apex, they fall inward. Okay. You know, if you didn't have the other dumbbell, you wouldn't like this. You'd fall all the way over. <laughs> <coughs> so right? so if we if we sum up about technique. So compound, big compound movements works, but they are not the best, and they can hurt your 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 joints because of the the, the weight you're using. Uh, fully contract your your muscle works, but it's not necessary. Plus, you're going to maybe damage your joint or two. Right, not as important as the early phase of the motion. Motion. Okay, so if you would do it again. I guess you would yeah. you would do only uh, one exercise per muscle you're working, uh, which would be not a compound exercise, so an isolation exercise, which fits the best the strength curve of the muscle, right. without uh, without uh, blocking uh, the joint and have the, so you would stop before the full contraction of the muscle. Right. And what about uh, how many times you train during the week? Do you do only one muscle per workout or two? No, I, I have four different workouts. I do chest and back on day one. I do deltoids and upper trapezius. So lateral deltoids, posterior deltoids, anterior deltoids, and upper trapezius on day two. I do biceps, triceps, forearms, and abs on day three. And I do legs, which is quads, hamstrings, calves on day four. And glutes? Uh, it ends up being, pardon me? And glutes? What about glutes? Yes, and glutes too. Okay, okay. So, what I actually do, my, my, my day four, I have day, uh, day 4A and day 4B. Okay. Day 4A is cable squats, which is a, a form of squats, and that's quads and glutes, followed by hamstrings, followed by calves. But on the other day, I do leg extensions, isolated glutes, hamstrings, and calves. Okay. So in other words, I either do the compound that works quads and glutes, or I do the isolated quads and glutes. And the other part is the same. So you're not, you are not using um, uh, bar, bar squats? How do you call it? Yeah. Bar squats or... Back squats? Or hack squats, but um, back squats, I, I was meaning. Oh, no, no. What I do is, uh, is cable squat. And the cable squat has a forward pulling resistance. Now, the reason I use a forward pulling resistance is because, um, as I was telling you earlier, when we select an exercise, there's two things, two big criteria that we want to pay attention to. One is the direction of the movement, and that is determined by the anatomy. And the other is the direction of the resistance, right? And the direction of the resistance will determine the resistance curve, whether it's early phase loaded or not, whether there's alignment between the joint and the origin and the insertion of the muscle and all that. Um, and 
in every case, whether you're talking about your bicep or your tricep or even your abs, you want to select a direction of resistance that allows the operating lever of your target muscle to encounter resistance perpendicularly somewhere in the range of motion. Okay, so if you look at a squat and you look at it from the side and you recognize that the tibia, the lower leg, is the operating lever of the quadricep. And you look at it and you see someone come down and come up, what you'll see is that the tibia doesn't even get to a 45 degree angle. It reaches about a 35, 40 degree angle, which means it's only about 50% effective. Whatever is on your back is only loading your quad 40 or 50%. In the meantime, your entire spine is getting 100% of that downward pull. In fact, and in my book, I just put a few pictures up where you can actually see that the torso lever is angling farther forward on most people than the tibia lever. Yeah. And, the, and the torso lever is longer. Yeah. So they're getting a longer magnification lever plus more of a perpendicular angle. They're working their lower back more than they are their quadricep. It's a foolish investment. It's like I, I made a joke and I said it's like selling your soul for a sandwich. You know, it's like, you know, you want a better payback you, and you want less cost. You want it to be less expensive. So by, by, by changing the direction of the resistance from straight down, which is free, free squats, to a cable resistance like this, you notice that this cable angle is crossing your tibia very perpendicularly. You're getting 100% of that on your, on your quad and a fraction of that on your back. Zero on your spine. Yeah. Right? So... The problem is that most people like to impress the observers at the gym. So doing 300 pound squat looks better than doing a 150 pound cable squat. Yeah. But you can literally not walk after you do the cable squats. You'll get better development and less spine damage by a cable squat. So it's all about the direction of the resistance and making sure that it's crossing the operating lever. And so in the end, how long does it take for you uh your, your workouts, how long do they do, you know? Um, they last between an hour and a half and two hours. You know, okay. we don't go very fast. I have a, a couple of training partners. We don't go very fast um, because we want recovery between sets. Um, and we typically do uh, an average of four exercises per workout, like two for chest, two for back, right? Three for deltas, one for upper traps. So it's usually about four exercises. And, and we do, you know, 10 to 15, 10 to 14 sets. For exercise. Yeah. And how long do you take uh, of rest between sets? Two, three minutes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a good idea. They've actually done some studies. It's not a good idea to start your next set with some lingering fatigue from the previous set. Yeah. You're better off starting fresh to and then wasting recovered. yourself during that set and then recovering again. Yeah. Okay. They've also done some research that you shouldn't go to failure until your very last set. Yes. Yes, I've read that. Yeah. So if people want to know more about the training techniques, uh, the exercise you've picked for each muscle group and stuff like that, how, how can they define this information? Well, um, I'm finishing a book right now. The book is called The Physics of Fitness. Yeah. Uh, I'm on chapter 23 of 27, so I should be done. Well, after I finish the writing, I've got to do the photos and the illustrations. I should be done. It should be available. In about three months. Okay. So figure about August. It'll it'll be available. Okay. It's about 400 pages. It's very extensive. Um, yeah. It's very complete. It literally answers just about anything a person can think of that relates to resistance exercise. It talks about cross education. It talks about unilateral versus bilateral. It talks about all these things. Um, reciprocal innervation. All these things that you are that. Reciprocal innervation has a surprising implication in some cases where you would not think it would. But so this book will be available about August. Um, I, I, you know, I, I've been overwhelmed with emails and I've been neglecting to answer them because what I find is when I answer one, I get people asking more questions. They're not of happy course. with just one answer. So I just don't answer any anymore. Um, but I appreciate everyone's interest and, and support and curiosity. And hopefully the, the, the book will answer all the questions when it's available. I'll announce it on Facebook. Okay. It'll be available, you know, on my website, which is dunbrignoli.com. Okay. 
And can people also hire you for private coaching, for instance? Yes, I mean, I, I certainly am available locally, you know, one on one, and, and I have had phone consultations, sometimes half an hour, sometimes an hour, and that works out very conveniently for people that are not living in the area. Yes, absolutely. Okay, fine. So. If someone would be interested in uh, such private coaching, they would go on your website and they would find all the information. They, they go want. to the website, they can email me at dbfitness at aol.com. Okay. Or they can find me on Facebook and send me a message and ask about pricing and timing and scheduling and all that. Okay. Well, I think we have wrapped it up. Thank you, uh, Duke, so much for taking well, the time to answer so my questions. It's um, a pleasure talking with you. Well, it, was, it was a pleasure. All right. Thank Au you. Revoir. Oh, au revoir. <laughs>